Hello, I'm Matt Peterson. And I'm Rich Trapier. And this is episode 48 of History on the Table. Rich, it, like, no joke, feels like it's been months since you and I have sat down and, and chatted. And it hasn't been that long. It just It just feels like it's been a long time. And it was funny because originally we were going to record early. Yes. Which was going to be like super short in between the episodes. And now it feels like it's been forever, so... May has just been a month of a kick in the you know what's. Yeah. But, but we're getting closer to Historic Fest. Exactly. With May behind us, we're in June, which is basically July, and that means we're practically in August, which means Historic Fest is more or less tomorrow, folks. So yeah. what are you doing? Go sign up. If you haven't signed up yet, you're probably already missing out on stuff. That's exactly right. Yeah, Historic Fest, August 17th through the 20th here in Overland Park, Kansas. Barbecue, Next War, ASL, Last 100 Yards. Whatever game you want to play, you come to Kansas City. We're going to have a good time. Drink some beer, eat some barbecue, play some games. What what more can you ask for? There's a link down in the show notes. And yeah, it's it's game time. It's time to start playing in shit, stuff, games, whatever you're going to do. Pop in the Discord, go set up an event on the, the link down in the show notes. Whatever you want to do. But it's, it's about that time, folks. Yeah, I've already got decent number of my games for historic fest already scheduled so i think i still have a little open space but we're getting there yeah i think i'm kind of chewing over what to do on friday you know we get the extra evening game but Mm -hmm. i i'm like kind of saving that for last because like what i wanted to play six months ago is is different than what i want to play now but um really looking forward to founding fathers on saturday yeah all right We've had, well, I've had some other things. I'm just going to plug real quick. If you hadn't heard, Desert, Deserted Island Wash Ashores, fellow Wash Ashores, Castaways, that's the word I'm trying to find. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, Art and Patrick and I, started a little side project. You can check it out at Black Lodge Trivia Night on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. And that's where we just do the whole RPG nonsense. Um, we've got Pathfinder in the works coming up as well as some call of cthulhu stuff and then we've been so far we've kind of done these like impromptu like when one of us can't make it uh like low prep things and then we have other segments where we just talk about rpg goodness whenever we wrap up a game and so that's new and exciting we just have a you know one play up so far in our first episode but yeah every every thursday we do that or is every thursday as much as we can and that's black lodge trivia night also if you like twin peaks if you don't like rpgs it's almost as much twin peaks discussion as well i like rpgs i don't know anything about twin peaks well great then I, it still works for you <laughs> or if you like none of those things it's just a good time so just go check like it out you and art and patrick exactly if you don't like the three of us, well, we still have you covered with RPGs and and Twin Peaks. So I like really hate one all way three can... of you, and RPGs are for nerds. But man, I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. Boy, do I have do I have the show for you? <laughs> so that's that's what's been going on in my life. May's crazy, but we're back. I played a couple war games, mainly our featured game tonight, Almoravid, and didn't really have anything come in except for a very long awaited game from our friend Sebastian Bay. Literal Commander. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm sure you haven't gotten to the table yet, but I'm excited no. to hear how you like it once you do. Yeah, if you want to know the the brief rundown of this game, go check out the designers on the mic interview we did with Sebastian. It's a fantastic episode. Sebastian's a great just follow on Twitter. Super active just in the educational war game sphere as well as just the normal design sphere. Uh, super interesting character and very exciting his, uh, his game. Oh, gosh, I don't even remember what the original name was anymore. Um, it had the name Marines in it. That's it. That's why he had to stop. <laughs> exactly. It. And now I can't remember what it was. And there's another one in the works. So this one is Indo-Pacific, the one that just came out that showed up on my table. And I think I just saw from the Deets Foundation that the Baltic – just got announced as well for for pre-order so but that's and i'm very excited about that but that's like all the activity or something like that oh it's different than that i it was so ingrained in my brain so like when you go listen to the sebastian bay interview it'll be a different name that we talk about and shortly after that interview it changed uh the game became available for pre-order and then they quickly had to change the name and now it's literal commander littoral commander yeah, I'm super stoked for it. Very excited. Just haven't had the time to sit down and do anything with it yet. Uh, maybe 
Maybe at Historic Fest. I'm going to have a crazy summer, but maybe at Historic Fest. Yeah. I'll definitely bring my copy if anyone wants to check it out while you're there. Well, I definitely want to check it out. Sweet. What about you, Rich? Anything on the shelf? Uh, it's just, just a little magazine game. I picked up the GTS Briefings magazine, um, which has a lot of good articles. I read it for the articles, I swear. <laughs> um, but it did have a game in there also that I haven't had a chance to play yet, but I'm going to play, I think, next week uh, called Strike Counter-Strike. Damn it, Richard. Did you buy another war game? <laughs> no, no honey, I swear it's articles. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> good pictures of tanks and stuff. <laughs> So yeah, I think I'll probably get. I think I'm gonna play that next week with uh, Todd. And nice. We'll let you know how it goes. Awesome. Anything else? No. As far as light new month games, for us. that's about it. Yeah. That's all right. We got plenty to play, man. Yeah. No <laughs> There's so many games on our shelves. And I actually got to play a lot this month, so that was good. Good. All right. Before we talk about those, let's talk about some books. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finish, finally finished Texian Iliad. By Stephen L. Hardin. I think I've mentioned it before. It's taken me a while to read it. Not because it's not good, but it's just one of those things where I just kind of pick it up and read a little bit. But finally, I got into it. And it's about the uh, the Texas Revolution, you know, the war between Texas and Mexico, which really wasn't between America and Mexico. It's between Americans and Texans or tech and, and Texas. So um, great book. My wife actually picked it up when she was at the Alamo a couple years ago for me. Um, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And then I read another one called 12 Days by Victor Sebastian. Um, and that was about the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. And that one was very good. I, I liked it quite a bit. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's 12 Days, what it's called? Yeah, it's called 12 Days. And it, obviously it covers more than that. It basically starts during World War II with like the, the Germans and the Russians fighting over hung, Hungary and then goes into some of the, the, the people that were that fought on both sides and sometimes they literally fought some people literally fought for both sides, fought for the Axis and the allies, uh, during the same war. Um, and these guys, a lot of them went off to Russia and they got sent back to Hungary and it's just, it, and then eventually the, the Hungarian people rose up and revolted against the, uh, the, the Soviet, um, it wasn't necessarily really against communism because a lot of the people in the revolt were communists still, but they didn't like the, the Soviet oppression of their country. So uh, they they had an almost successful revolution and then Russia just really stomped them with a bunch of tanks. And um, it did have some long lasting effects. And a lot of people considered that to be like the, the first crack in the armor of communism sweeping over the world. But uh, yeah, it was a good book. Did you do an audio book or? Yeah, print? yeah, it was an audio book. Huh. I might have to check that out. I mean, that's like such a, you know, there's a topic that I don't know yeah. anything yeah. about. Yeah. Much I've like. Obviously got a lot of Hungry World War II games. The only Hungarian Revolution game that I know of, it's it's actually two games called Days of Fire and Nights of Ire. And I think it's a, it's a, they're two games. I don't know how they fit together, but they're obviously the same publisher and everything. Um, and it's just looking at the map, although I haven't played it, looks like it's an area control game. Nice. Yeah, I've heard of Days of Iron. I didn't know there was a second one or a follow-up or anything. Cool. Uh, speaking of topics we don't or I didn't know much about, and I'm spoiling my recommended reading for a featured game, I am in the process of Kingdoms of Faith. Um, I was just going to read – so Kingdoms of Faith by Brian Catlos. This covers Islamic Spain. Um, and when I checked this book out, I knew it was going to be a busy month. I was just going to read the section – kind of covering Almoravid, um, 1085, 1086. That was very short in this book. And so then I was like, I'm just going to restart. And I, I started reading. So I've caught back up to where I read first. Um, and really this is a more modern take from all the books that Volko referenced in the Almoravid recommended reading and, and sources that he used. This was the most modern, um, which is and also most available like from my library. Oh, it's really good. It again, it doesn't spend a whole lot of time in that kind of 11th century, early 12th century time period, the same as Almoravid. It really stretches from like 700s all the way through uh the 15 up up until the 1500s through the 1600s. Um I like it a lot. It's it's good. It's well written. It reads quick. It's not super in depth, you know, with anything like this. And I'm doing it in paper. I would love more maps. I just I don't know how many 
times you can show a picture of Spain, but it would be nice to be see like how things change. Uh, it's good. Brian, uh, Kingdoms of Faith, A New History of Islamic Spain, Brian A. Kalos. Cool. So how big a time period does it cover? It goes from 700 through 1615. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And there's like a 80-page section covering 11th century 12th century and so again it's not a it's not a ton but Mm -hmm. i read the little blurb that was kind of relevant here and they're like no i want to i want to keep reading this thing i I took it on vacation and uh, ended up pulling it back out after doing that so i liked it all right games games on the table i couldn't remember i don't think we've recorded since i played levy and mass um and so if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but I haven't talked about Levy and Mass yet, have I? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I'm this is a state Napoleonics. It is, and it's a States of Siege game. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was a deluxe reprint of this, and I think I talked about when it came in from Worthington Games, and so it kind of just cleans up the game a little bit and throws in a lot of counters and stuff you don't really need. I I think you'd be fine with the old Victory Point Games version if you could find it super cheap. You know, some of those Victory Point games. Older versions are, are cheaper to find. I think on sale this was like 60 bucks or something like that. I don't really know if that's justified for what this is. In terms of Levy and Mass games, I really did like this. Um, I did a playthrough on our Friday streams. That uh, was the last thing I did before kind of life got crazy. Uh, really easy to pick up. Rules are super straightforward. And it's just a tightrope between i mean i did terribly i made it to the end without things falling into you know complete a complete burning pile of, of trash but uh, then my final score was atrocious and so yeah this covers the this covers the french revolution it's it's very good i would say if you can find a cheap copy it's a great solitaire game i wouldn't go like pay sticker price for the new deluxe version though huh. so so states of siege games are typically you are holed up somewhere like in Israel or Constantinople or in a fort surrounded by Zulus and you're getting mm-hmm. attacked by different directions. Um, yep. How does that work in this one? Is it, is it political? Is it mobs of people coming after the King? How's that? No. So you're playing the Republic and you have British forces and Florence and Austria. Who am I? forgetting there's five of them must be something coming from spain Spain, as well yeah Yeah, and then so it is armies converging on you as france basically yeah but then you're also there's three other tracks that you're balancing as well and those three tracks end up being like hugely important like you can do a pretty good job of kind of staving off the armies i i had a decent go at that but then you're also keeping the monarchy in check and keeping and kind of measuring despotism like you don't want it to get too high but maybe early on you do want it high so there's this kind of other one where you kind of got to gauge it in between and then obviously you want the republic as high as you can and things will happen in paris where you have to go quell that but if your republic's higher than anything else you can like do it automatically uh it's it's good it's states of siege with a few other tracks i don't know if it's my favorite states of siege but i thought it was it was really cool to play through i did like chronologically like you can just open up the deck and play if you want or you can shuffle it up but i played it with like the chronological events to see to see how that shook out okay cool yeah it's levy and mass states of siege game those are if you're unfamiliar they're solitaire only games and as rich said these converging tracks and you're just trying to survive as long as possible i felt this was one of the easier ones to survive but you had to weigh other things which ended up really hurting me nice. all right what about you been, uh, you've been so, playing a lot yeah i got to play a bunch of games um at our game day this month i played the british way which is the new four two-player coin games all in one box okay and then we so we played palestine um there's i don't remember what the others are i think there's palestine kenya um i don't know what the other two are because i didn't see the game it wasn't mine but in any case if you want to there's actually campaign rules so you can play them all in chronological order and i guess you know what happens in one game affects the setup of the next game or something i don't know but we played the first game which is palestine and we just we played it twice we kept the same sides but we played the game twice he won once i won once um it was fun um it was interesting i like the things that they cut out of it so i mean you look at it and it looks very much like a coin game but there are some minor differences like uh well one major difference is that 
you don't have to pay for operations. There's no, you know, in every other game, sometimes they call it different things, aid or whatever, but there's some way to pay for what you do. And this one, you don't do that. You just, you get to do it in a certain number of spaces and that's it. Um, and then the score in the game is basically British will. So if you're playing Palestinians, you're trying to drive the British will down to zero. If you're playing the Brits, you're just trying to stop that from happening. The game plays really quickly. Like I said, we played it two full times um, in, I want to say like three hours, maybe four tops. So, and that's still, you know, like learning the rules, but there wasn't a whole lot to learn either. So it was, it was simple. It was fun. Um, that's about all I can say for it. I mean, it didn't make me want to rush on and buy it, uh, but I would play it again. Nice. Yeah, and then uh, I got to play a game of ASL. My daughter is, she's back and forth for the summer. Spent about half a week here and half a week back in, at school. So uh, she wanted to play some ASL, so we did play a game of ASL. We played a scenario called Gavin Take, which I had heard was a, a good one that was fairly simple, but still interesting. And it was good. Basically, the Germans are kind of hold up trying to protect the um the, the exit hex and the americans just have to run past them and get guys off the board um and the germans are in a good position because they got some machine guns but the americans have amazing leadership they've got a 10 minus 2 and a 10 minus 3 leader so oh, dang. they can shrug off a lot of hits um but you know it was a if, if you want to play a small asl scenario doesn't take too long doesn't have anything bigger than support weapons great scenario i played again so Cool. Uh, I got to play SL. Um, I got to play Sekigahara, which uh, is another one my daughter has been wanting to play again. So we played that one, and I was doing really well. I was, like, wiping the board almost with her, and I blundered into a mistake, and she killed my leader and ended the game. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. <laughs> I mean, I could have easily just won on points, but I was like, nah, I'm just going to go ahead and take this one more castle. And she had, like, every card she needed to to wipe me out, so... That's kind of funny. That's how my last game from yeah. last month kind of ended. Like I, I, <laughs> I pulled a ballsy move with my leader to go in and do something, and then I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out in time, yeah. and they died, and I lost. <laughs> yeah, she's like, like the ten minutes before, she's like, "There's nothing I can do. I'm just there. I'm, I'm lost." I'm like, "Well, you know, keep." I said, "Do you want to concede?" And she's like, "No, we'll keep playing." And and we did the battle and. I was like, you, you just won. She's like, well, how did I win? I'm like, you you just killed my guy. That's it. <laughs> so, That'll do it. Yeah. Love um, Sekigahara. That's yeah. Great. Another coin game I've been playing, Rally the Troops, has Andy and Abyss now. Oh, which, yeah. Which I have never well. played that one until it just came out. Um, so that's, uh, except for maybe like, I don't know. I, is, is Power of the People out yet? I don't think that one's out yet. I think... My point I'm trying to make, though, is I think playing Andy and Abyss on Rally of the Troops means I played every coin game again. So um, funny, because I think that was the first one. I had never played it before, but I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Um, we played like the first game and I played the the yellow guys who just have to have like more bases than I think the green guys or maybe the red guys. Then the won, FARC, the commies, yeah, the I reds. won on the first propaganda because all I did was build bases and everybody wasn't really paying attention to <laughs> me. So we're playing again now, but it seems fun. I mean, it's it's coin. I don't know what else to say about it. It's not it's not blowing me away or anything, but it's fun yeah. to play. So and yeah, coin you know, is more fun in person. That's exactly what I was going to say, and I know we had that conversation, but it's I love the rally of the troops implementation because it does make playing these coin games so much easier. But yeah. um, you're still missing that that component. But as far as Andy and Abyss goes, I really like it. I like it at four player. I probably don't like it as much as uh, a distant plane uh -huh. or all bridges burning. Okay, but and depending on the faction I'm playing, I do like parts of it. I do not like the three player mode where someone plays both. So you can play it three player on Rally the Troops and someone okay. takes both Auk, the AUC, Gorillas, and the Cartels. Okay. Was not crazy about that. Um because I, I was stuck doing that. But yeah, it, it reminds me a lot of a distant plane. If you sat them both down, I would play a distant plane before I'd play Indian Abyss, and it's probably just because a distant plane was, you know, further along in the lineage and Yeah. I don't know. It, a little I, more interesting topic for me. It reminds me more of Kuba Library. In fact, so right now I'm playing the cartels and the cartels remind me a lot of the casinos. 
I see that for sure. I guess I'm looking through it from the viewpoint of the government troops and yeah. police, yeah. Um, which is the first my first two games of Andy and Abyss. One we're playing on Vassal, it's still wrapping up, and then the first probably the troops game I got stuck playing the government as well. They play very similar to the government in, uh, in uh, a distant plane. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's so great that, and I was going to talk about this when we talked about Almoravid, and obviously we're going to compare that to Nevsky at some point. It's really interesting what. I think the designers that are keeping an eye on Rally the Troops are doing with it. I saw a tweet or some kind of correspondence from Volko where they've taken the play data from Nevsky and it's allowing them to adjust scenario balance. Interesting. Because the his point now was now you have hundreds of gameplay data and the game is done, but you know, how many times are you gonna play test a scenario? Yeah, I could see someone like Volko playtesting in a bunch, but that, not every designer is going to do that. And so someone with their pulse on everything that's going on and rally the troops, if they can see that data, which obviously they can, mm-hmm. now Volko's taking that data and my understanding is making adjustments to the Nevsky scenarios, which is something about these online board game implementations I've never thought about. With Vassal, it's, it's completely different because the logs are, are private. You can't like go through someone's log of plays, but with Rally the Troops, they're able to see which sides are winning or which scenarios, and what a great tool for designers to basically get further playtesting even you know post-release. Yeah, and especially, I mean, with uh, Levy and Campaign, I mean, it's already turning into a big series. It's just going to get bigger. I mean, it's it might end up being bigger than Coin at some point at least a number of games, but um, they've already taken what they saw in, I guess in Almoravid and maybe Inferno as well, but I think mostly in Almoravid and made changes to the Nevsky rules based Mm -hmm. on that. So, Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. I wonder, will this be a designer by designer basis? And we we do have a listener question that's somewhat related to this, and we'll get to that later, but is this going to be a Volko call? every time you know a game's going to go up there or is at some point gmt going to come in and, and maybe it won't be gmt it's you know compass or whoever mm-hmm. you know vassals kind of in this interesting kind of wiggle room where a lot of designers allow it and are okay with it not all of them are but rally the troops just feels even more overt and maybe maybe eventually it's going to change and go the way board game arena where you have to pay to get this stuff and then the publishers will will start taking a piece of the pie i have no idea this is complete guessing game um but it does seem to be in the sweet spot where things are too good to be true i i will be surprised if it the trend continues to just have these banger you know triple a games start showing up on rally the troops for no cost Sorry, you had one more game left. I did have one more game, Operation Mercury. Uh, I was actually going to play that with Todd, and then I ended up having to cancel, and he's out of town now. So we're going to play Strike Counter-Strike later, but I ended up just playing Operation Mercury myself. I played the the first uh, scenario with the German airdrop, and um, it was actually, I mean, it turns out to be a pretty fun scenario when you actually play a day and a half instead of three turns like we actually looked at, accidentally looked at the first time we played it, but um there's a, a whole lot of uh whole lot of greek guys but there's random events that can cause those guys to run away the german guys are definitely better quality but you've got to punch your way through a lot of greek guys and a decent amount of british guys too so it was fun love it rich that's not the only game obviously we have al as no, well but we have other games. another game that's right the game the game of games it's the war game game folks rich come on down all right, now we've been doing all sorts of things during this time slot. What are we doing tonight, Matt? Yeah, and I have decided that I've made it way too easy on you. Trivial Pursuit? Come on, <laughs> what is that? I don't remember what we did last time, but it was, oh, it was the my take on the British game show. No, we're not yeah, doing any of that bit. shit. Yeah. That's that's soft stuff. Tonight, we're back to the war game game. Old and school. No softballs. This is no lobs, anything like that. This is, this is stinky cheese coming at you. I got a all tough right. one for you. Okay. Is it submarine? No. Dang it. All right. Okay. I'm screwed then. I'm going to try to start hard and, and get easier. <laughs> um, artists for this game have included now Morgan. You know that I never know artists. Of, of course. That's why I'm starting here. <laughs> Morgan. And this is this is the name that is provided to me. And I. Th- oh, well, hold on. Let me do Redmond A. Simonson and Joe Yaust. And then Morgan Crusader Bible. Morgan Crusader. 
okay. So, which I think is obviously not an artist, but it's a source. I just find it funny that it, uh, all right. Um, listed. let's go with, uh, Kingmaker. No, nice guess though. Okay. <laughs> The designers for this game include Anthony F. Buccini, Jim Dunnigan, and Redmond A. Simonson. I've heard of one of them. You haven't heard of yeah? So you've heard of Dunnigan, right? Yeah. You haven't heard of Simonson? Simons? It's probably Simonson. It geez. doesn't jump out, but I'm, okay, I'm sure he's done other things that I know, but yeah. Yeah. So Simonson makes a lot more sense than Simonson. Sorry about that, but he was a he was an SPI guy as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um. I can see this game and I can't think of what it's called. I played it at don't not at Donkey Kong at AAC Con a couple of years ago. It's like a like a fantasy conquest game. It's probably not that though. Uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and pass. Okay. This game has included a couple different publishers with a couple different versions. This game was first published by SPI in 1980 and later published by Decision Games in 2004. <laughs> so even the reprint is almost 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, Decision Games 2004. You know, that Crusader Bible thing makes me think it's some sort of Crusades game. Hmm. I can't think of any SPI Crusades. I'm just going to like make up a name and see if I get lucky. Um, is it called the Crusades? No. No. All right. I told you. I told you it was going to be <laughs> tricky Tricky tonight. This game won, was nominated for and won the 1980s Charles S. 1980 Charles S. Roberts Best Pre-20th Century Game. Hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> Keep going. This game covers the economic and political landscape of medieval Europe from 771 to 1467. Huh. Well, I kind of want to say Europa Universalis, but I don't think that's it. But that's Nice. My best Good guess. guess. No, that wasn't it, though. Um, where are we at? We're at we're, artists, we're designers, publishers... <laughs> theme okay this game went on to be the basis for the sword in the stars which is a galactic empire game based off this game wow i've never heard of that either that was an eric lee smith joint sword in the stars uh i don't know keep going okay doing my public service making everyone feel smart i don't i don't know if the rest of these clues are gonna game (laughs) i know you've heard of this i am certain you here okay i'm gonna i'm gonna take a little pivot here because the rest of the clues i have i don't know if they're gonna help you which is why i'm struggling here i will i'll give you this clue which is subjective to rich and a few people who are at historic fest and that was i purchased this game at historic fest 2022 there was a lot of old games purchased there i don't know what you bought I'd have to look at the show notes from like last September for games on the shelf. I don't know. I think, man, I might strike out on this one. I I think you're getting very close to flirting with it because now we're getting into like game mechanics. Yeah. And I don't know if, so I can have you suffer through those or we can just go straight to the rhyme. Let's go straight to the rhyme. All right. This game rhymes with Sempires of the Diddle Pages. <laughs> I have never heard of Empires of the Middle Ages. <laughs> really? So the, I'm going to look that game up now because, man, that does not ring any bells at all. It looks pretty darn sweet. And our buddy Nate pointed this game to me out when they were setting up. And he's like, oh, that game's sweet or something like that. I never heard of this before. And I told you it was going to be a hard one. But it's got this, at least the Decision Games version has this great, like, striking purple cover with this orange that text. And it's got the fantastic cover. Yeah, there's like an archer up and a bell tower shooting down, shooting down these and... horses charging forward. There's a trebuchet. It's it's awesome. And everything, like, the turns are these 25 the year long turns. terrible. <laughs> It le- leaves a little to be desired. Now, which <laughs> board are you looking at? It's a map of Europe with, like, colored labels on it. That may be the old SPI okay. version. I think they, they cleaned it up for uh Oh, there's some a computer version of it, too. 
I tell you what, I'm a little bit more after setting this up when I learned about, I did not know about the Sword in the Stars until uh, getting these. And that looks pretty sweet and also looks like it's a heck of a lot easier to get your hands on. Uh, not the best ratings, but <laughs> I mean, that looks like an absolute 80s banger as well. <laughs> and so yeah, it's got these like 25 year long turns. Yeah. And then you can do a bunch of different things, range from like diplomacy to pillaging and, and all kinds of stuff. Really tricky to uh, track down, I think. But if you can, it looks pretty awesome, at least according to our buddy Nate. And at some someday, I will I will play this game. It plays one to six people. I don't know how you'd play it solo, but you could because there's like 150 event cards. Yeah. And there's a PC version. Looks like it's from like Windows 95. But Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Well, maybe the next Rich, one can be a little easier. <laughs> all right. So I got to gauge it between how easy <laughs> Trivia Pursuit was, how hard this was. I knew I knew it was one that I thought would trip you up, but I thought maybe it would ring some bells or I'll, I'll try to keep it in the last 20 years. All right. I've got a guessing game for you. Okay. The first hint. This is a game about Reconquista and Repost in Spain. What is this? A transition? <laughs> yeah, this is a transition. <laughs> All right. Try to get away from that war game game as uh, fast as possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna guess Almoravid. There you go. 2022 release from GMT Games, designed by Volka Runke. This is the second game in the Levy and Campaign series. We've done an episode on Nevsky. We're still going to talk some of the basic mechanics of Levy and Campaign, and obviously we're going to do a little bit of the differences between this and Nevsky. There are several key ones, and some, some minor ones have been transitioned over to Nevsky, as Rich said. But I think we should we should set the scene, right? We should do a little historical setting, because much like Nevsky... You know, the whole time period of Reconquista is hundreds of years, which I did not know. And Volko has, again, just like with Nevsky, just chosen this small slice. So you're talking 8th century through 15th century as the whole Reconquista period. And this game, Almoravid, specifically focuses on 1085 to 1086, with King Alfonso VI advance into the Muslim <clears throat> Taifa states and the eventual counter blow from the fundamentalist Muslims that were convinced to come and, and help the uh, Spanish Muslims against the Christians. And so it's a very small slice of just, you know, a year or so uh, in two particular campaigns. It's about 200 years before Nevsky. Um but different different part of the world um the historical i mean i will say that i other than just kind of knowing that the muslims advanced up from africa into spain and eventually at some point were pushed back um, by the christian kings and then they were kind of back and forth for a while in spain other than that very high level i don't really know much about the history of that time period yeah, this a lot of this was new to me. I'm kind of in the exact same boat. It's like I knew that there was this presence and this kind of ongoing and blend of cultures, right? Like for some periods you had Christians and Jews and Muslims living together in Spain in some kind of blend. And it, it wasn't obviously very clearly, it was not always perfect, but it was also not always, you know, constant warfare. And so it was this ongoing period. Uh, all this is new to me. And I think the big, like, kind of takeaway from this time period is like the Siege of Toledo. And then the Battle of, I'm going to remember, misremember the name, Battle of Sagrajas. Yeah, I don't know if that's, you have anything else to add historically? Anything else? I don't know if there really no, is much to add. Other I than... don't, and, and I know you said you read a part of that book that covered this time period. Yeah, but I didn't even do that much, so I don't have a whole lot to add to it historically. Yeah, so there was this really what is kind of I guess interesting was there was caliphates before these weakened Taifa states, and so the whole history of spain from the 8th century th up and through this time period is really interesting like you have a really strong caliphate and then that falls into these weakened states which i from my understanding is really allow what allowed alfonso to even kind of do what he did which 
eventually led to him conquering Toledo. But yeah, it's it's a very interesting time period. I've really enjoyed reading about it and playing games on it has also really just in, uh, enhanced that appreciation and enjoyment of the time period. It's pretty cool. At least cool for me, you know, 1,200 years later or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, this is Levy and Campaign, follow-up Nevsky. Levy and Campaign is like a two-part game. The Levy, you're building up supplies, you're planning for the future, you're bringing on... Uh, new lords you're bringing on new vassals you're equipping your troops with new capabilities and you're gearing up and you're getting supplies and transportation and it's it's this whole planning for these long ongoing campaigns which is one of the first takeaways i'll point out from nevsky is there is no short winter campaigns in this game you're talking seven to eight cards every time you enter a new campaign so you're doing long-term plans and the levy phase is you preparing and gearing up to carry out uh, those campaigns. And then you transition to the campaigns, which uh, we've talked about with Nevsky, and it borrows from Angola, is you build a deck of cards, making the order you're going to activate your different lords that are spread out across the map. And some lords can do have more cards than others, and when their card comes up, they can take a certain amount of actions, whether that's tax or um, pillage gather uh, supply march siege any of those things and so this you're wearing kind of two different hats you're you're a planner and a strategist gathering resources and then you enter into this campaign mode where now you're on the march now you're besieging cities now you're trying to take her and capture uh territories yeah and just to add to that so one of the things that you're always doing is recruiting these lords that are technically under you but not necessarily actively fighting for you you're recruiting them to actively fight for you and when Mm -hmm. you do so you're going to get them for a certain number of seasons so you know maybe four or five seasons is is average um and then after that time period they're just going to go back home so there are things that you can do to extend their time and there are things that can be done to you to make their time shorter um, if you pay them, they'll they'll stay longer. If they don't get fed, if they lose in battle, things like that, then they will uh, they'll leave sooner. Sometimes, even to the point where if if their their leaving date is prior to today's date in the calendar, basically, then they'll never come back. Otherwise, you can possibly get them back later if it's a longer game. But if you think about it in terms of this guy's going to be with me for let's say five seasons, probably two seasons are going to be you doing now there's always a levy and then a campaign a levy and then a campaign Mm -hmm. but those first couple seasons are probably going to be just planning in the hopes of getting two or three good seasons of fighting out of him so um i would say it's probably a good rule of thumb you're always going to be doing as much planning as you do actively campaigning now in the longer campaigns with more lords you can start overlapping you know i know this guy's going to go away in three turns but i got this guy to come up and sort of take his place and you know that's really a higher level strategy at that point. But um, that's kind of the gist of the whole thing is, is getting these guys to fight for you, planning their campaigns and then moving them while they're, while they're still loyal to you. Yeah. And I think it's one of the real beauties of the, this is not like a combat is very different in this game. And it's, it's much like Nevsky where hits are automatic and you roll for defense. What the beauty of this game is everything that Rich just talked about. It's maximizing those lords to to bend them to your will the best way you can. And some lords are going to be able to do, you know, four things every time they come up on a card. A lot of these Muslim lords are just going to do one or, or two things. Or they really have to wear, this one's got to do this, this one's in charge yeah. of this. And then they really can't even, like, hoard that much stuff. And so a lot of planning goes into that. And that's that's one of the design intents is this is a game about campaigns. And that really comes through. And all those things that Rich just talked about is... You're not just, you know, charging in and, and, and sieging a, a castle. And you're going to make mistakes. I still make tons of mistakes playing on route the troops with Nevsky. I've played so many games now, and I, I'll still do silly, silly things like get the wrong transportation or, or whatever or make the wrong plans. And then it's, you know, a couple seasons unwinding the, the blunder I made. But that's what's awesome 
I, or at least it's one of the things I think is awesome is, is just all this thought and development into your campaigns and then, you know, just kind of seeing what you can do with them and getting the most out of your plan as you can to maximize the limited time and the limited actions you have with each of your lords. Yeah. And I feel like we're talking a lot about the series more than the game. Um, sure. But, but we'll get to the game. I think that's just because, I mean, we've already talked about Nevsky and I mean, the series the the basic mechanics are the same there are differences um and but just to add to that one more thing about the series you were talking about storming castles that's a hard thing to do in this game um mm -hmm. especially and there's there's different defense levels of castles but if you've got i mean honestly like a like a level three which i think is the highest level if you've got a level three castle garrisoned in all of my games of nevsky or almoravid i've never seen one of those taken <laughs> It's just, it's so hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I um, I think that you, you're right, that we're framing this in the series and stuff, and I think that's just a good, peop a good reminder, like if no one's played Nevsky. Um, I think one of the questions that would be asked right away is, okay, well, which one should I get? What are the differences? And I, what I'll say just as as the big picture look at the whole game Almoravid if you're familiar with Nevsky you could basically pick up a scenario the quick start scenario and get up and get going yeah there's some there's some different things going on there's some there's this whole really cool underlying politic um thing with a different type of states and so they'll actually change allegiances depending on what's been conquered. If a lord's present, that type of thing, they can be fully independent, or they can be you know recaptured, reconquista, or they can be paying up uh, praises um, and like paying tribute to the the Christian kings. And so they're they're in these varying states. But really, in terms of differences, if you know Nevsky, you could almost pick up Almoravid and just dive in and start start kind of going and looking things up and just kind of work through the politics phase as you as you play yeah and there is a page at the beginning of the rule book that lists mm -hmm. every change between Amaravid and nevsky um and if if you are doing that if you're just you're saying hey i've already played nevsky a dozen times i want to try this one i would say to keep that page open in front of you um the 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 typha politics is probably the the big picture biggest change um, but then there's like some small mechanical changes. Mm -hmm. I would say like the, the forage and ravage changes are the biggest ones. Yep. Um, and the rest of the stuff is just mostly little changes. But if, if you don't pay attention to those, you're going to be playing wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because so for, ex I think a good example of, if you're not paying attention to those is transport. So oh, yeah, in that's Nesky, another one. you have four different forms of transport, carts, boats, sleds, and ships here. You have two forms of transport and one of them is going to eat your food so not at, in nevsky a big thing is if you march or battle you have to feed your troops okay well if you use donkeys in almoravid you go faster but you also have to pay them every time you feed your troops now you can let your donkeys go i'm sure they go to greener pastures and nothing happens <laughs> to them uh, and you don't have to feed them but that that's a that's a whole new element. So on one hand, like transportation's been simplified a little bit here than compared to Nevsky. It's not this, you know, juggling back and forth. But it also now has this new element of do you also want to feed your transportation to go a little bit faster? Uh, and so you can still get bitten if you're not paying attention to those those subtle differences. And there's other things, you know, there's one Lord in particular, El Cid will transfer between the Muslims and the Christians if the circumstances are right and, th and that type of thing. But generally, I think the games are very similar. I yeah. think Almoravid feels bigger in scope um, and the map just feels bigger. I don't know. Yeah, if it's more so in Nevsky, there's really, there's like two passages between the two countries. I, that's not exactly true, but it feels that way because there's a sure. big lake in the middle. Um, so that's that's not exactly true, but it feels that way. Whereas in Almoravid, it's just like oh, one big map, so you yeah. can you can literally go anywhere. I mean, there are still roads and everything, but it it feels more open in that respect to me. 
And I think like victory is a little bit different where if you conquer a stronghold, you'll get victory points for that. But as you transition from Prius to Reconquista or independent like mm-hmm. that also for a whole type of state, that's also also going to award victory points. Right. And in Nevsky, yeah. the, the regions don't mean anything. Right. It's just I mean, there's there's towns and castles and you can get half a point for or, or a point or three points for taking land or specific areas. But here there's. There's benefits for for taking a region as well, which does not exist at all in Nevsky. I think we said combat is largely unchanged. There's some there's some subtle differences, but you're still gonna kind of follow the same sequence of sequence of events with you know defenders hitting first and everything having a fixed type of hit. You know this person when they fire some kind of missile, they're gonna hit for half. This person's gonna hit for one, and then you roll uh, defense. Um, there's armor as well as evade defense. Some things might evade very well, but they only evade in melee combat. But I didn't like combat felt the same to me. I don't. Did you feel that the same way? Oh yeah, it felt the same to me. Yeah, and it, just like in Nevsky, the player aids are really good. I mean, you're gonna want the player aid even if you played a bunch yeah. of times to show how, what everything does in combat. One thing that I did not get to do with Almoravid that I've gone back to doing with, I started with it when I first started playing Nevsky is I did the Fog of War. And then I transitioned away from it just to like get better at yeah. Nevsky because I'm still pretty bad at Nevsky, let's be honest. Um, but now that it's on Rally the Troops, I've transitioned to using Fog of War. I did not use Fog of War with, with Almoravid, um, which is generally what I'd recommend if you were going. And I played this with someone who really has played no historical games or it's been a long time since they have Mm -hmm. and we did the quick start just so we could kind of like jump in and like there was no baggage with crts or anything like that which was nice um but we did not do fog of war which is generally what i'd recommend if you were just starting out with this i fog of war is awesome i really like it but i just i I wouldn't do it and i didn't do it for uh you know a fresh learn of almoravid or anything like that yeah, I would say, like, if you're an experienced player teaching a new player, I would say keep a fog of war off so that they can look at your forces and they can they can learn faster by going, okay, I see what you're doing here. But I would get into fog of war as quickly as possible just because I think that's really cool. I think it makes it, it better. I mean, that's that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I do think it makes it better. Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. I like the cards in Elmoravid a lot. I think some of them are, um, especially they're very crucial or they feel crucial, but then it's the same balancing act. Every time you take a card for a capability, let's say you give uh, battering rams or something to someone, you're taking that event away, which may mean events can be really nasty. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Maybe less so in Almoravid, and maybe that's just because I've I've been able to play so much more Nevsky. Like some Nevsky events can feel really bad, and maybe I just haven't seen the full slate of Almoravid cards. But events can make a big difference, especially in terms of like Lord eligibility and when they come on or when they come off, because you can shift them to where they run off the map. But you forego those random events by taking a capability, but at the same time. I always feel like capabilities are, are crucial, especially like you said with the strongholds yeah. in Almoravid. Things like, like crossbows and trebuchets, things like that are they're really nice to have. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything anything else that you kind of want to hit on for differences or, or anything like that. No, that's it. Um, I wouldn't. I don't know that I would say that one is simpler than the other. There are minor changes, um, but I, I I don't necessarily say either way that, that, oh, this one is definitely a better starter game than the other one. I think they're both about the same complexity. Yeah, you know, those quick, we, and we talked about this when we finally played Nevsky, is those, the quick start scenarios really helped me get over that hurdle. And yeah. I think if you start with a quick start scenario and you don't get bogged down in the type of politics, which was an interesting choice. And I don't know if that was listed first because, like, you're you're assuming that people are coming from Nevsky, but kind of the most... Up, up two seems too hard because I really like the type of politics mechanics, but... The, le- the one of the more least straightforward rules in this game is the politics and why they matter and what effect they have on the game, whether something's pain Prius or it's independent or, or whatever. Um, 
that did that seems like a little bit of a hurdle, but I think I read somewhere in the playbook like just go and then look up those rules and that was fine. But I could see that being kind of a a sticky a sticky wicket for for someone new to levying campaign. Yeah, I could see that. Um, yeah, yeah, I could see that. I just I think yeah overall they're they're about the same as far yeah. as complexity and. And as always, if if you are really interested in the history of this time period and you don't care about Northern Europe, the rest of the Teutons, then this is definitely the game for you and vice versa. Yeah, so that, that I guess that brings up a good question is like, okay, we've talked about the mechanical differences and I think I said that Almoravid feels bigger to me. Um, did you have like an overall feel difference? And it's like completely cool if you didn't, but like did one feel more planning focus and one feel more or um, anything like that so to me the the rule change between the two that made the biggest difference in the way the game feels is the ravage and the forage rules um because it made it made as would be expected it made northern europe in the winter feel harsh and unfriendly whereas this felt like it was warm and things regrew and it allowed you to to go back and that the 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 land itself would sustain you better because you know ravage markers go away and things like that and um, there are certain places where you can always forge because of the gardens and other places it's harder whereas in Nevsky it's it's more it's very simple although I think they did change some of the Nevsky rules in the second edition which I usually don't play unless I'm playing rally the troops because I have to um, right, right so yeah the, those were the two that made the games feel different for me yeah i don't know if it changes big picture one thing that i thought was cool is how ravage markers flip like if you retake a territory right. or you take a stronghold and the ravage marker was on your side giving yep. you points and you take that stronghold and it's ravaged those points flip to the other side yeah because now you have yeah you have taken ravaged land yeah i don't know like a feel like there's you're right they're so similar and like now you're getting to the point where you're splitting hairs but i don't know if like if i sat down and played these back to back against an opponent i would be like whoa those felt totally different obviously the politics component is new and the fact that you have a lord who can start on one side and then transition to, to the christians is really interesting but i don't know if it's like a fundamental shift in the in the series yeah. there is a big difference between playing and the abyss and all bridges burning they have a very different feel sure. um i and this is you know probably just with the lineage i don't know if there's that big a difference between playing a distant plane in indian abyss um and so maybe we're like there in the design process or something like that they're both great and they're both fantastic uh, so overall, what did what did you think of Elmer Robin? Overall, I liked it. Um, yeah. But every time I played it, my my sort of prevailing thought was, I'd rather just play Nevsky. Really? Yeah. And it's not it's it's nothing at all wrong with Elmer Robin. I think if I had played Elmer Robin first, I might feel the other way. I'm not sure. Um, for one, Nevsky. I mean, my people were germanic so i mean nevsky kind of hits a little closer to home as far as personal history um whereas spain doesn't for me so that's it's a little thing but that's a that's a tick in the direction of nevsky and mostly just every time i played almoravid i just i just thought okay this is different um but I, i'll just play nevsky there was just nothing nothing about this that made me want to select it over nevsky Okay. And it's not I, that there was anything wrong with it. Right. Like I said, if if I had played them, if I had never played Nevsky, I think I would probably appreciate this one more. I just don't like it as much as I like Nevsky. Okay, so I think we're a little bit different here, which is, like, I obviously, I still very much enjoy Nevsky. I think it's a great spot on our list, and and I'm not dethroning it in any way. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's a top 20 sure. game on our list. And I think this is just like a new thing to me. Like this is new and exciting. And look at the new things they're doing with cards here. And Oh, they've added this politics and changing Lords alliances. Like, Oh, where is this series going? And so like, it's new and sexy right now. And I'm nowhere near sick of Nevsky. Like, Oh, if someone wants to play rally the troops game, as soon as you hear this episode, just send me an invoice. Let's fire it up. Let's go. 
because of that newness, the new shine, the new car smell, I'm a, I'm leaning towards Almoravid. And I that could also be dealing with what I'm reading. And mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about another book at the end of the episode when we get off the table and we stop talking about history. I actually read a fantasy book to go along with this. It was fantastic. I'll real quickly mention the name. It's called The Lions of Al-Rasan. Um, and the book I'm enjoying. As much as I love Finland... Which I'm just going to lump into Nevsky because it's it's all up there and involved. I would love to see that be extended more into Finland at some point. Um, this one is taking the cake for me right now. Again, a lot of it because of the new new levers to pull is a good way to put it. So that's interesting. And I think the history, because like I said, I haven't read a history book on this. Um, I know a little bit more about the history of the Northern European stuff. So that. I could see what might be a point in the other direction if I had read that book and if I knew more about the history of this one. Mm. Because to me, these games are, I mean, they're obviously very close games. So to me, I think there are slightly different mechanics, but I would say, like, if I were assigning some sort of point system, you know, the mechanics are maybe worth, you know, a couple points here and there, but the interest in the history and the setting is going to be worth more. So that's why I like Nevsky more, I think. That's fair. I get that. I think it's well said. I don't really know if I have. It's kind of weird because I don't want to rehash so much of what we've said about Nevsky, but also if someone's like listening to this for the first time, then I, then I want them to know. I I just do think there are in both games, whether we're talking Nevsky or Almoravid, or I'm sure it's true of you know upcoming games, there's lots of points of decision that seem small when you're learning the game at least they did for me it took me a long time to really start seeing the nuance in the little things and i i kind of talked about the cards taking an ability a capability means foregoing the event that's a little thing that i don't pick up on the nuance on until then you like see the effect of the events and then you look at the card and you look at the capability and you want it and you see the event and so i think levy and campaign is really you know we both talked about it. it took us a long time to finally get it tabled yada 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 but once you did it's actually not an overly complex game i think the decisions are tough how do i feed how do i move and all this stuff but once you get over the rules they're very straightforward and then the more i think you play them then this kind of nuance to the decision comes out about these games at least that's, that's been my experience the more i play these the deeper appreciation i get for this series and the more excitement i get for it going forward not every game in this series is going to be for me i'll tell you that right now i'm not this isn't like a get every one yeah collect them all they're very specific ones i want and i'm okay with that and i'm excited for that yeah yeah i agree um and i'm not i'm not that interested in inferno although you know i'll play it as someone puts it in front of me i'm really looking forward to plantagenets when that one comes yes. out so but again that's history and setting is more interesting to me on that particular game so um i will say also so with nevsky um i mean i've probably played it 10 times before it came out on rally the troops and i've played it at least that many times in rally the troops whereas on almoravid yeah i mean i started playing that one this month and i've only played it solitaire and i've played like four games of it so haven't played the full campaign haven't played against anyone so um all of those things are gonna are gonna make the game better once again like you said playing it more you appreciate it more and playing it against someone is very different from playing solitaire oh yeah and a lot of my play this was solitaire too there was some like advice on how to play solitaire um in here yeah it was kind of cool to like teach uh teach someone like who hadn't who hasn't really played war games but Mm -hmm. then like kind of talk them into like hey i'm in a time crunch (laughs) and here's this really sweet game about like kind of a topic you're like a little bit interested in at least like as in terms of christian crusades like i'll walk you through this and we don't get like here's this quick start guide and so like that was kind of a cool experience but then i'm I'm in the same boat with you just like with what may was a lot of it was solo play and stuff did you play the mini game did you do the battle no, I didn't do that one. Was that um, the scenario? No, no, no. There's like a – you can set up – so when – gosh, I wish I remembered um, Sultan Yusuf. You, when Yusuf and 
all the Muslim lords attacked King Alfonso, there was the Battle of Sagrajas. Uh-huh. I think I'm getting all that right. And you can just set that battle up and play it out. I did not do it, uh, but I, I want to. Um, and so you just like oh, set yes. up their Lord's cards. Yeah, it and, is in the scenario book. I kind of skipped over it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, I yeah. mean, you don't use the map or anything. You just right. set them up and you give them some capabilities as it's set out and you just kind of play it out. It's it's really a mini game. It's actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you wanted to see how combat worked out and not worry about anything else. You could just do that and go through combat. I'm I'm sure that'd be fine. I just, I thought it was a neat inclusion. Like, hey, here's yeah. something else. Yeah, and that's kind of cool because, um, you know, it's got the battle mat. It has rules in there for big battles, but you usually don't see big battles. Usually they're, they're if you if you have a big army, you're probably going to go pick on somebody with a small army and it's going to end up as siege somewhere. There's There's been very few times, none in Almoravid, but even in Nevsky, very few times that I've had like the battle mat full, like, like three full armies on yeah. each side, and you're getting to use the flanking rules and all that. Every once in a while it happens, but it's it's rare. Yeah, I'm sure maybe someone more experienced than any of these, because I'm in the same boat. Didn't happen with me with Almoravid. Rarely with Nevsky. And like you said, even if someone does get someone in the wings, usually the other side doesn't have someone in the wings. Again, that could just be my experience and like not that much skill, whatever. Um, that's great. I will say, if if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to Nevsky and you're interested in these games, don't go into these games with like a, a standard and we, we've talked about it a little bit, like standard understanding of how combat's going to work. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, you won't have a CRT. It's, uh, you, you kind of have a chart to work through, but it's it's very different and it kind of breaks the norm. And I think, and Volko mentions this, there's an interview, Designers on the Mic, go listen to it with Volko, where we, we talk about Nevsky and I ask him about why do combat this way. And his point was to more just focus on the levy and the operations and less so about the individual battles and so that's still my least and it's not a bad thing it's like the i wouldn't say my least favorite or like my biggest dislike it's but it is the thing i like least about this series is the combat just because it's so good like what if this had a robust combat system to like really crank things up to 11 and it doesn't and that's okay that's just personal preference but that's just like it was with Nevsky, it's here now, Moravid, same combat resolution. It's fine, it's enjoyable, but I'm always left like, ooh, what if what if this was something else? All right. Uh recommended reading. I recommend the book. I recommend both books actually. Lines of Al Rasan by Guy Gabriel K, which is a fantasy book that takes I said I was gonna talk about it later. I'm gonna talk about it now. It basically rethemes uh, Reconquista and some new religions and a new. It's not really a new setting. It's still España in the book. It's fantastic. Uh, really recommend it. And what's interesting is you can see how obvious he like just copped from Reconquista during this time period because you have people like El Cid. And they flip between sides. And the cities, some of the cities will sound the same. And you'll you'll hear about some of these great cities falling after the caliphate falls. You'll hear about how they fell. And then you go read either Volko's play or the Kingdoms of Faith book. And, and you see, like, how ha- hard he borrowed it from. So it was a really cool. And probably why I'm really interested in it as well. Like, it's so well written. It was my first Guy Gabriel K book. I, I really liked it. And then the other book, Kingdoms of Faith, already mentioned that as well. I recommend that as a good, like, overall history of uh islam in spain i want it like if you want an in-depth book about this particular game volko's got some recommended reading as always the playbook is fantastic with chock full of stuff highly recommend reading through that all right anything else you want to add about the game rich nope nothing else for me okay if that's the case you know what time it is we have a list a list a list of every war game ever made, ranked from worst, from best to worst, one through. This is about to be game sixty-nine. Nice. Uh, and yeah, Rich and I, we we merely don our our matching aprons. We we crank up the clay wheel, and once the mud starts spinning, we just 
we just embrace each other's hands and stick them out there and see what shape what shape the clay we are merely the sculptors of the list yeah so this is going to be somewhere between one and i'm gonna say it's going to be less than 68 because i i think this is better than the zeppelin raider okay well i think yeah i i agree i think that's a bold claim i'll i'll let it slide that this is better than uh zeppelin raider i think the natural starting point has to be nevsky right nevsky's 16 on the list and this is the successor to nevsky yeah and just to fill in around nevsky so we've got i'll start at 14 but we got second fleet korea the forgotten war which is ocs nevsky next war vietnam and then thunder in the ozarks so that's the area we're talking about and honestly i don't see any reason to go more than one away from nevsky i think you and i would rate this Hmm. on different sides of nevsky but i think either way i think it's got to be paired up with nevsky yeah, they're that close. Because I think it's better than Vietnam, and I don't think it's as good as OCS Korea. Well, the, I don't know. Maybe uh, I could yeah, see I mean, if we flipped Nevsky and OCS Korea. Um, that I don't know. I wouldn't go above Second Fleet. That's for sure. But I yeah, and I don't know if I'd go above Korea. Not to say that it's not better yeah, than Korea. It's just not. It's not that much better that it deserves ranking ahead right. of it. And yeah. you're right, Korea is epic, and it's a wonderful OCS entry. Um, the question is, are we going to be able to agree of if, if it's above or below Nevsky? So I agree a hundred percent. It's right there with Nevsky for me. If you ask me today, it's above Nevsky, but also I'm not going to fight tooth and nail because when if someone said, Hey, let's play Nevsky or let's play Zeppelin Raider in each other's laps or Hey, let's play, Almoravid and I'll sit in your lap or we can play Zeppelin Raider like I'm going to be happier playing Nevsky or Almoravid any day that's a really long way of saying I like both games I'll be happy <laughs> if either one shows up at the table yeah and I could go either way as well so but we can't just say that we can't have it both ways so we got to pick so let's think about this well it's hard I was going to say like Almoravid does more for the series but Nevsky started the series so it doesn't necessarily do more <laughs> Yeah. But it does interesting things that just like shows like, hey, this won't be the same thing over and over and over again with slight little adjustments. Yeah. We say they're very similar, but they're they're significant changes that change the overall play of the game. Yeah. Um, and looking forward, even though I have never actually seen the game, um, the addition of the areas as as political areas to conquer yeah it's probably going to make a big difference in plantagenets i'm guessing that mechanic will stay yeah you know i haven't looked and i think it's I don't gonna know. be really important in plantagenets yeah if it's in there i have no idea if it is or isn't but i haven't seen anything from plantagenets other than knowing that it's there i saw the map um and it looks cool yeah. yeah i don't remember if the little boxes for allegiance were on there or not yeah um but that doesn't help us, Rich, because that's not that's not Nevsky or Almoravid. No, but it's it's an addition that Nevsky doesn't have. I'm trying to see things your way. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean and, it, and it, honestly, I can say I I can argue that I would rather play Nevsky, and and even if I put Almoravid above it. All right, let's do that then. All right. So if you want to play Almoravid with me, that's fine. I'll play with you, but I'd rather play Nevsky. And I'm the, I'm, at least today, I'm the <laughs> complete opposite. Which, that's great. If you want peanut butter, you can hang out with Rich. If you want chocolate, you can hang out with me. Or we could play side by side. There we go. A campaign. <laughs> yes, exactly. The lasting effect of the Reconquista on the um, Baltic Crusades. Someone write a paper. All right, folks, normally this would be the part where we plug our Patreon, patreon.com slash history table, where you can go support the show and vote on each of our featured games and get the Discord access uh, to the patron stuff on Discord and all that fun stuff, which we'll still plug, patreon.com slash history table. If you want to support the show, go do that. That's great. We do have some news this month for June, though. We're exercising a, a rare host fiat uh, just with some upcoming health stuff I've coming in june i just know what my availability is going to be like 
and I talked this over with Rich. I'm not just dropping it on him. We have decided to designate a game for June, and it had to be something that I could play easily and reliably, and we talked about it already, but Rally the Troops is perfect for that. And we are going to play Wilderness War, another Volko game. Didn't think about that when we talked about it, but I guess Volko's getting two months back-to-back. Uh, Wilderness War, a 2010 game, card-driven game, from GMT. It may have... 2001. When did that game come out? Anyways, it doesn't matter. We're playing Wilderness War. Uh, I'll be continuing my read of Wilderness Empire 2001 for Wilderness War, by the way. Yeah, looks like first uh, edition was 2001. Yeah, so... Play that with us. Send in your thoughts. Uh, I'm going to read Wilderness Empire as well. I have lots of time to read and play games and rally the troops. Uh, and we'll we'll declare a winner of our Wilderness War tournament because I'm sure that Paul and Rex will have their game that's been going on for over a year. Even though everyone has been able to play except them, uh, I'm sure we'll have that victor crowned of, of that, that tournament, I'm sure. So Wilderness War in June. Awesome. All right, Rich. Anything else about the... Uh, Almoravid, Nevsky, or Wilderness War, or Volko in general. No, but I would say this is a great plug for Rally the Troops in general, though. I mean, how awesome is that that we can play these games there? Yeah, it's really cool, which is a great segue into our listener questions. Let's start with Lucifer, because I think this is this is relevant. So Lucifer asks, uh, how do you feel about print and play? Should more AAA titles be available, new or out of print, out of print at a lower cost? I'm thinking players that don't have the room for physical games and or would just rather play online with legal access to PDFs, so still supporting the designers, artists, etc. Or they just don't want to play the out-of-print market price. Yeah. Um, so I'll share my thoughts first. Print play, if, like if a designer wants to make print and play and a publisher wants to make print and play stuff avail- available, that's great. I mean, really, that's rally the troops and and vassal isn't that far different right i guess the difference there is for those things you don't i guess some companies you have to buy their products and they don't make the rule books or the scenario stuff available online which is which is a great way to get around that stuff um i think it's fine i don't know if i have like a strong opinion about it i think the reason i put this question on here is i think that virtual tabletops are going to push this into an interesting uh conversation over the next few years yeah, print and play in general is not something I've ever really done. I think the only thing I've ever printed and played was uh, there was like a small scenario for Unconditional Surrender Europe that I played with. Mm. Um, it was like an add-on. It might have been in a C3I or something, but I printed it just to play that one. For the most part, I don't print and play just because um, I'm just I'm a tactile guy. I like to clip my counters. Yeah. I like real maps. I like plexi so that I don't have a little bowing in the map. I'm I'm just weird about stuff like that. And if I print it myself, it's probably going to look like crap. Um, I don't even have a color printer, so I don't want to pay to go to Kinko's and print it there. Um, that said, I mean, I know guys that do print stuff and, and, and print it well in full color with, you know, styrofoam to give the counters thickness and all that. Um, so how do I feel about it? I'm all for it, but I just don't do it myself and I don't see myself doing it in the near future. That said... I think that we are probably, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 20 at the most years away from everyone having a 3D printer in their home. Um, And I think when that day comes, we might see a huge shift, not just in, you know, war games with counters, but I mean, print your own minis games. And I mean, it could be that every game you're just going to buy the rights to and you're just going to print it at home. it, It wouldn't surprise me at all if that's the way it looks in 20 years. Yeah, so I'm in the in terms of like the right now. I'm I'm with you. Um, I think in terms of like a lower barrier of entry and a cost effective way for, for people to experience these games. Like if there's a print and play option, and then the, like you're still supporting designers, you're not just like throwing all the files out there so people can do whatever they want. That's great because I understand like board games are a luxury, and they're insanely expensive for what they are a lot of the times, and and war games especially like. The decision, or not decision, the um, the block war game company. Well, I'm sorry, I can't think of their name, but everything like Hammer the Scots and all that stuff. Uh, Columbia, jeez, oh, yeah. Columbia Block War Games. 
Like, they're fetching $80 for a new copy of Hammer of the Scots, when I guarantee you could find a used copy for, like, 10 bucks if you really wanted to look around. Like, those games have been around forever. There's nothing new and innovative in the new printings, and it's just, it's so expensive. And so, for a lower barrier of entry, I like it, but I'm just right there with you, Rich. I'll only do print and play out of necessity. I, I print and played uh, Corsair Leader before that had an official uh, copy, but I hated it. Like, I hated playing on, you know, shit I just printed out for my printer. Um, a little bit different for, like, 18xx. I've seen wonderful print and play copies. And for a long time, that's all you could do with 18xx was play someone's print and play copy. Um, now, there's great resources out there like Wargame Vault, where games that are out of print are on Wargame Vault. So, something like uh, Operation Pegasus is on Wargame Vault. If you want a copy of that game, that's a great game. It's not... If I didn't have an original copy, that would be something I consider print and plain just because I have no other way of doing it other if Vassal didn't exist. I get, but yeah, uh, great question, Lucifer. It's great as a lower barrier of entry, just not for me. And I'm also lazy and it just takes forever <laughs> to do that shit. I did print and play um, the greatest game ever, uh, Dick, Dutch Inner City, of course, because that's a super easy print and play. And getting a copy of that is impossible. Uh, Boink Marrier Kill. So it's Arts Monthly Boink Marrier Kill. And he, in a slight breach of etiquette, he did not do a completely war game topic, will allow it. So, Rich, Boink Marry Kill, hockey, war games, or barbecue? This and is, barbecue. This is just rude. It's cruel. It's cruel I mean, and unusual I think we kill punishment. Art, right? <laughs> so, good. Uh, I don't know. You want to do our, our boinks first? Sure. Yeah, you go first. Uh,. I think I'm going to boink barbecue. Just get yeah. that sloppy, sloppy sauce That's all over my face. Exactly <laughs> where I was going with it. Yep. We're probably going to end up the same, I'm guessing. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. Barbecue. I mean, as long as we're talking Kansas City barbecue, then I'm boinking barbecue all the way home. Yeah. Who are you going to marry? I am going to marry hockey. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to marry wargaming. All right. So why, why are you marrying wargaming? I don't know. I mean, I think... As much as I love hockey, if I had to either give up watching, I don't play anymore. So if I had to give give up watching hockey or playing war gaming, I think I'd rather play war gaming or war, war games. So you're thinking about this all all wrong, Rich. And I'll tell <laughs> I'll tell you here when we, when we get to the kill. The reason I pick Mary for hockey is one because Rich is thinking about this wrong. Two, um, <laughs> my wife loves hockey, and so if one of them did actually have to go. I, I'm sure that it would be that uh, War Games, unfortunately, had to go if, if my wife made me. Uh, but, Rich, I'm killing War Gaming because you know what? You know what else that leaves room for? Conflict simulation. Oh, there Historical you go. Historical board go, yeah. gaming. I'm covered, baby. If you kill War Gaming, you also get to kill the decision of the discussion of what is a War Game. Thank you. So exactly. That's, that's the right answer. <laughs> yes. I, you know what? There will be some some sacrifices along the way if we kill wargaming but there's still plenty of good games out there and through semantics i will still enjoy this hobby there you go suck suck on that one art <laughs> <laughs> scuba ass i don't even know why I this put is this a one weird on here. one <laughs> we had oh, first off thank you everyone for the fantastic uh questions this month i did not take everyone's um but and I threw scubas on here. And then when I did, I was like, "Why did I include this?" But here it is: If History on the Table were a true crime podcast, which host would be the murderer? Like, which we can both agree, it's clearly you, right? Oh, I guess you wouldn't admit to that. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything without my lawyer. Are you my lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'd agree on on who's who, and then neither I mean, of us I could, I could, I could it. see people like coming to my devastated wife and family and my neighbors, and they're like, "He seemed like such a nice guy. <laughs> he just <laughs> stayed at home and walked his dog and played board games. I would have never known." And that's how they describe every murderer. So yeah, I guess that's I guess that's me. <laughs> By the way, uh, stick around for our post, uh, or <laughs> and this is not a real thing, but check out our Patreon for our exclusive. Uh, I don't know, my f see when a date to, to my basement. <laughs> what what do you call it? Win a date to my basement. There you go, folks. The here's here's my promise. At some point, Rich and I are going to record a true 
crime uh, <laughs> podcast called Win a Win a Trip to My Basement. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Did you ever watch? Uh, have you watched the Steve Martin and Martin Short and uh, Only Murders in the Building with uh, I can't think of her name, Selena Gomez? Thank you. No, I've never seen that. Was that a movie or what? It's on it? Hulu. It's there's two oh, seasons, no, I seen it. and uh, they're true crime podcast fans. And then of course there's a murder in the building. They start their own podcast. It's I love Steve Martin and uh, they're all all three of them do an amazing job in it. Highly recommended. Interesting. No, I haven't seen that. All right, to bring it back on topic, John R. asks, do you enjoy specific historical eras? Do some turn you off? Are there any exceptions uh, for you? So great question, John. And John asked this when I was away on vacation, and then uh, some credit to Mitch as well for uh, pointing this out, like, hey, that would make a great question for the show. So this was a question on uh, on our Discord. I So American Civil War one of my favorites obviously probably my favorite do you have like a, a an outright definitely your favorite rich i think it'd be world war Two. yeah uh, i mean uh, the, like, and i think i i because i've actually had conversations with my wife about this like why do you like world war Two? i think world war Two is an interesting place in history where you have i mean i hate to talk about it this way because obviously millions of people died and we take it very lightly but you have a place where the technology is is very interesting and there's new things going on, but it's not so much so that, you know, you've got like guided missiles and insta kills and guaranteed hits and stuff like that, which yeah. you still don't, but it's 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 new ish technology with a lot of uncertainty and the results. Nice. I mean, that's kind of like with the Civil War. You you get these set pieces, yeah. but you get a little bit of introduction of of uh, new new technology, not mainly um, like breastworks and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But one, it's familiarity with landscape. It's something we grew up with. For people who who didn't grow up, like I'm I'm gonna assume here, Rich, you were like me with. Well, I, I don't know if you went to public school or not, but my public education, like every history class each year had something to do with the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, so familiarity, but also just like the the uncertainty of the Civil War is one of my favorite reasons to game it. And I think one of the games that do that best is, is GCACW, right? The Your commanders are not always going to do what you wish them to do. Roll to move sucks, except yeah. for in GCACW where it works perfectly. And so, so things like that historical era – especially because of the uncertainty of, of what's going to happen with your leaders is one of the reasons why I, I like it so much. Yeah. You read about a lot of the campaigns and you've got like three different brigades and okay, everybody attack here at nine o'clock. Well, at eight thirty, one of the brigades is stuck <laughs> in a swamp that they have right. to walk through and they're going to show up at 10. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll also say like, of course I'll like, pumpkin spice latte all the way i love world war ii gaming as well <laughs> i also love just obscure things it's it's one of the reasons why brotherhood and unity was interesting all bridges burning gosh even almoravid and angola i i'm not a huge fan of angola but like what a great topic anything that will do something fresh touch on a new topic or touch on an obscure topic if they do it in, a, in an interesting and meaningful way uh, or even like a controversial topic or something that's uncomfortable, like gaming something like a distant plane in Afghanistan mm-hmm. at the time when Brian Train and Volko did that. And like that's ongoing. It's it's not just fresh. It was ongoing at the time, you know. Um, any anyone that does that in a meaningful way is I will always turn an eye towards that and be very interested in it. Yeah. Anything turn you off? Yeah, there's certainly things about the U.S. Civil War time period that that are big, huge turn turnoffs for me, and that gets outweighed by an overriding interest in in how I approach those games and the lens I'm viewing them from. At least, at least for me, I understand a lot of people can't do that. I don't, I don't know if anything turns me off because even in things like SPQR, which is just not for me, Tactical Ancients is not for me. There's still redeeming qualities, right. and there's still things in that era I want to explore. I don't know if there's yeah. anything that's like, oh no. I mean, what, was, what about you? I was going the exact same place. It, I wouldn't. It's way too strong to say it turns me off, but Tactical Ancients always just feels like two lines slamming into each other, mm-hmm. and that's just you. All you're you're hoping that your your morale doesn't break is. But that's kind of what they did too. So right. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. But but it's not it's not as fun to me. I like games that have a lot of maneuver and positioning, and 
decisions, whereas technical ancients, from what I've seen, doesn't have as much of that. So, yeah, you know, World War One would be another one that isn't a turnoff, but it's it actually ranks down there pretty low. But yep. then there's always like Paz of Glory is great. Um, so when he asks about exceptions, like there's exception, like there are a shit ton of stinkers in the US, in the Civil War that I don't want to touch. There's great games in World War One or or ancients that. I want to play the shit out of. Yeah. All eras are game for my table. Yeah, there's there's no no era that I would say, nah, I'm not interested in that because of the era. There are some topics now, that... War 2 stuff, if some guy shows up wearing all black right. outfit with skulls on his hat and says, let's play a World War II game, I'm probably going to find someone else to play with. That's exactly <laughs> where I was going. And there are games, and there's recent games, and I'm not going to like point them out, that are out there that do things with a historical topic that I'm not interested in. And it's a lot of it's like, what if scenarios like post world war two, and I'm sure there's other problematic ones, like things like that. I have no interest in. Yeah. And it's, it's not just like a, what if like, what if the U S had done this? It's more like, what if the bad guys had won? And it's like, <laughs> I'm yeah, just like, I'm not into that. Right. Sweet. Okay. Anything else? No, no. Nope. Okay. Okay, so we do have a little bit of war game stuff left, and that's just really we're not doing the whole GMT rundown, but I am gonna mention, Rich, it's finally, finally here. And I know it's here because we got a clue in May's GMT monthly update. A multi pack game for Mark Herman and Alan Ray. Yes. Do you know what this is? So I think we're talking about Compass Games finally sold Battle Him to GMT. Oh. And they've got no. a new develop oh, not that? No. Oh shoot. This is Thunderbolt. This is the final uh, conclusion to the Ancient World series. Gosh, is that what it's called? It's yeah. They're they're all going to be published together, right? All three yeah. of them. Yeah. So it's like so, Carthage and I know Carthage was one of them, right? Yeah. So the series is the Ancient World. Carthage is the one I have, and yeah. then there's an, another one uh, which we don't need to bash our head against. But Thunderbolt is finally here. And it's going to combine all of them, and I th- like the one I want to play the most is is what's in the uh, in Thunderbolt. So finally, it's it's here. This is the continuation of Richard Burke's series. And uh, my understanding was that Alan Ray and uh, Mark Herman picked up the the mantle to finish it with Alan. Alan's done a lot in redoing like the rule books and, and stuff like that. So what do you think that's going to cost for the three pack? So I've been exp- I've been pre-ordering some very expensive games from MMP lately. <laughs> yes, agreed. Pooh, that's a good question. That's an interesting. I guess it depends if they can fit it in a standard size box. I mean, I could see it being, you know, 120 or something like that, which for three full games is not bad. Yeah, I I I I, I don't think this will compare to like the other multi packs, right? So like what was I wonder what like what Men of Iron tri pack was because that was around like eighty bucks right or something yeah. like that and the the coin four pack just came out I don't know how much that one was but yeah that's different though because Men of Iron tri pack was like three like real games and not that the right. four coin games aren't yeah. but those are like mini games yeah and so you're getting this you're getting second Punic War what was the third game I don't even remember anymore so Thunderbolts the second Punic War. I don't know what the I don't even remember what the first one was. I I don't think it was the third Punic War, but whatever. Not gonna not gonna bog everyone down with it. But I think yeah, somewhere eighty hundred bucks that'd be sweet. I mean, GMT hasn't like seemed to burst into the like really expensive MMP multi back pricing. Would I be surprised if it went up to like one twenty or something like? That? No, not at all. All right, now the other stuff. Sorry, I mentioned one of my books. So yeah, if you're if you're done with war game, if you're here for the war games, we're gonna talk about all the other stuff that Rich and I enjoy. And we're gonna talk about some fiction first. I mentioned Lions of Alrasan. Can't recommend it enough. Great audiobook as well. Great narration. Loving it. The other book I finished was Those Across the River. Rich, this is you read Between Two Fires, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is a book written by the same author, Christopher Buhlman, before Between Two Fires. Uh, called those across the river he wrote uh, it before or it takes place before like in the oh wrote it before like okay. this he Got wrote it. this before that so um i like between two fires quite a bit 
more for whatever it's worth. I gave Between Two Fires a 5 out of 5. Or in Goodreads, I gave this a 4 out of 5. Um, it was good. It's uh, set in a small town in Alabama uh, during the Great Depression. And there's some nasty secrets in that small town. Uh, very quick read. Recommend it. Liked it. Love Chris Buhlman. Um, but I would read Between Two Fires any day before I, I read those across the river. So then I have another one up in the queue from him uh, on Audible, and I can't remember what it's called, but I'm going to keep reading them. Have you ever read the uh, King Killer trilogy by Patrick Rothfuss? Or... Just the first book, because I keep okay. saying the third yeah. book will come out, and that's when I'll read the second one. I know, it's so frustrating, but <laughs> it's I've read it multiple times. I just absolutely love it, even though it frustrates the hell out of me that he won't write the third book. But <laughs> uh, I actually finally... I've been saying for a while to my wife, I'm like, it's so good, but I don't really want to recommend it because, you know, there's no third book. But but finally, we finally got around to reading with her. We're loath listening to the first book again and just starting it back up again. I mean, it's already it's just it's so well written and I love the characters and like from the very first chapter, you know, not much of a spoiler because I don't even know what happens in the third. But I mean, he did something big that changed him and the whole world and you don't know what that thing is but already from like the first chapter i'm like dude what did you do and why did you do it i have to find <laughs> out <laughs> so that's that's fun going through that one again i just i love that book so much i hope he writes the third one yeah and i keep like that's my excuse for not reading the second one yeah i should just read it because I, I you know <laughs> that's supposed to be just as good but it's like oh that'll be my time to reread the first one which i loved i agree yeah. it's a fantastic book and then i'll read the second one then i'll be ready for the third but yeah we'll see if that ever happens yeah uh yeah my family and i we finally got out frost haven it's been oh, nice. on our shelf waiting for a while but now that my daughter's sort of home for school for the summer we decided now would be a good time to do it it is I mean, it is just such a massive beast. It's it's bigger than Gloomhaven. It's just it takes up all this table space. I mean, even though we all have played Gloomhaven, I mean, I've played the Gloomhaven campaign multiple times, and even so, we're like, first of all, you got to figure out what the differences <laughs> in the rules are because there's some subtle differences. And I mean, it took us an hour just to set up the first campaign, and then oh, it's such a mess, but it's it's good. So once you get it sorted and organized then it goes a lot faster and you can you can play regularly also we didn't use the computer for anything last night like we didn't use the the helper app but i think going forward we will use that because that'll make things faster too and it'll allow us to take some of the stuff off the table and put it on the screen which will be nice nice and then uh we, i told you last time we talked uh that i was going to play um uh what's the cthulhu not Pulp Cthulhu? Uh, no, not Pulp Cthulhu. Acton Cthulhu? Not that one either. Uh, what's the one? Oh. Where you, uh, Trail Green. of Cthulhu? What's it? Delta Green. Oh, Fall of Delta, Delta Green. Green. Yes, uh, but we got it canceled. We had two people oh. cancel on us, so we didn't get to play this weekend. So we haven't even rescheduled that. I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's always frustrating. Um, that's on my That's on my list for uh, doing something with Black Lodge is, is Delta Green for sure. And I... Yeah. I they're yeah the the campaign like they have a, a king and yellow campaign that just came out and it's it's amazing oh, cool. everything i've read so far but i also then just want to do like a twin peaks-esque fall of delta green uh some kind of scenario on my own yeah and then we were looking for something for me and just my two daughters to do like when my wife is busy or whatever so we wanted to start up an rpg and i was trying to think of some rpgs that would work well with just two players uh -huh. and my first thought was well screw matt i'm just gonna go ahead and read witch burner <laughs> ah. <laughs> but I, I didn't do that because i still hope that some someday rent boy will show up and we'll be able to play that one <laughs> your characters are so good in witch burner witch burner is an rpg it's a uh, system agnostic that rich and uh another guy were playing and they like just organically came yeah. into like the two best characters ever it was so They're good so good so um, but then I thought there's an RPG that I have had sitting on my shelf for probably 10 years. I've read the book multiple times, never had a chance to play it, but I think we're going to give burning wheel a go. Nice. Cause that'll go well. It's good for storytelling. It's good for low character counts. And, um, I think they're both, both mature enough and good enough RPGers to handle the investment that it takes in that system. So I'm looking forward to getting into that one. Love it. 
Have you ever Love actually it. played it? Just Torchbearer, which is based okay, in, right. in Burning Wheel. Yep. I think Burning and, Wheel is one of those ones that everyone knows about, everybody wants to play, but no one mm-hmm. ever actually plays it. Yeah, it's kind of like Lancer. Yeah. Like, which is near the top of my list as well. Like, it picks up a lot of buzz, but I don't actually know anyone that plays it. Yeah. We Sweet. finished up our alien game with Hollywood, so. Oh, nice. My character heroically died. I think only one of us survived. Now, you did, uh, so Alien can be played cinematic or, or campaign-based. I assume you did a cinematic, like, one-shot. It's not yeah, not a one-shot. Right. It's a cinematic, like, one yep. story. Yeah, that's what it was. Nice. And that changes some of the mechanics of play a little bit. But, yeah, Alien's such a great um, system. I would actually probably, you know, I also really like, that's the D6 system from Free League. Mm-hmm. The panic mechanics in Alien, I would probably port over next time I do kids, um, not kids on bikes, um, Tales from the Loop or Things from the Flood. Okay. Um, which predate Alien, and they have the same kind of mechanics. You can push your roll, but usually you'd like, maybe you sacrifice some, like wits or something like that. Um, but I just like that panic mechanic so much in Alien that I think it would just port it over because I think it would work in just about any kind of horror setting especially with like kids you know once one kid starts sure. panicking then it rubs off on the other ones yeah you playing anything else right now any rpgs uh yeah i'm I'm still in two different savage worlds games uh one set in space one is set in uh dark middle ages and uh, loving loving those and on Thursday for Black Lodge Trivia Night, we are playing something pretty cool. It's uh, cyberpunk, but it's a it's a rules light game, and it's spelled like cyberpunk without the vowels. So C B R P N K Core. Uh, it was a it was a game that Art found off itch, um, and yeah, it's just like a rules light pamphlet. Uh, for playing a cyberpunk game which is great because it's been i've been diving into some cyberpunk different rule settings um and there's no consistency on what's good and what's not it seems like so as i dive down that rabbit hole i haven't been able to play anything and this will be a great intro to finally try some kind of uh dystopian future i mean i've played alien uh which has certainly got strong dystopian vibes but nothing like in the, in the cyberpunk universe or anything like that yeah i've never played what's the like the main cyberpunk game what's it called cyberpunk red yeah, or shadow run shadow run that's what I was yeah saying. i've never played that or any cyberpunk game but i i've always thought the um the idea of it sounded really cool but yeah never played any of them nice that's that's what i've got going on are you, how's your warhammer game going did you play uh, that still or? going yeah we, we actually skipped last week because we had some conflicts but we'll we'll be back at it next week so still going still going we're st- all still alive very good nice anything else to add this month rich no i don't think so i got uh i'm gonna have a busy month we're gonna have i mean we're gonna have two rehearsals a month because we're getting ready for our competition um and then yeah. So we are actually our my chorus, Ambassadors in Harmony. We actually won this contest. We were supposed to open for Foreigner in July. Oh. Yeah, it was gonna be kinda cool, but then the logistics were weird and so there's like a depending on how you count us, but anywhere from like ninety to hundred and twenty of us in the chorus. And they're like, Yeah, you guys won this competition, you can have a maximum of twenty people on stage and we're like, Well, that's not us. So we ended up turning down uh. the offer, but I was kinda looking forward to that. That was gonna be fun. Well, congrats on winning it. Yeah. Bummer that didn't work out like everyone <laughs> thought. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I know uh, that's about a month away, you said? the Yeah, beginning of July. So about five or six weeks. Well, you and I will talk before then, I'm sure. Best of luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Everyone else, stop by the Discord. Pop into some games with us. Come chit-chat about your favorite eras or uh, play your own rendition of boink marry or kill or take a stab at the war game game come share your score because we're keeping very diligent records of everyone's score on the war game game i promise you pretty sure you beat me and <laughs> could probably a decent chance this month not gonna lie rich that was that was something this month <laughs> but uh yeah stick around for next month where we get a double dip of volco with wilderness war 
We'll be back. We have some uh, some designers on the mics and Deserted Island Dice. Individuals selected. Now it's just a matter of getting them on the calendar. If you didn't, if you hadn't yet, go listen to our uh, office manager, Wash the Shore, and go listen to Patrick. And yeah, I'd really appreciate it if you go over to YouTube and give Black Lodge Trivia Night a subscribe or follow us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. But we'd all really appreciate that. So if you like RPGs or Twin Peaks or Art or Patrick, go check that out. Anything else you want to plug, Rich? Nope, that's it for me. All right, folks. Everyone. Thank you.